in the book, you mention a couple of well-known people that you're not the biggest fan of. One of them being Steve Martin, who you did Little Shop of Horrors with back in 1987. Why did you not enjoy that experience? And he was incredibly un- unfriendly, but he was a <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Well, Miriam Margulies, thank you so much for chatting to news.com.au. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm actually in Lismore. And I've never oh, been wow. here before. It's a wonderful place, Lismore. I've been to a, uh, a New Year's festival there called Tropical Fruits, which is a little bit wild. Uh, I, I'm realising that almost everything in Australia is a little bit wild. <laughs> and I thought I was wild, but I'm tame in comparison with what goes on in Australia. You are definitely not tame because you've got this new book out called Oh Miriam. It is full of some wild stories from your life. Um, I would like to ask you about some of them, if that's okay. Yes, of course. You mentioned in the book that you turned down a role in a Marvel movie. Can you tell me what role it was and what film it was for? I don't. I mean, it was very recent. This was only about, I don't know, two months ago. Oh, wow. But um, they rang up my agent and I didn't know, I hadn't really heard of Marvel because when I was little, Marvel was a comic. Mm -hmm. They just uh, contacted me and said, we're doing a story about um, witches. I thought, oh God, not witches again, uh, because I've done that (laughs) with Harry Potter. And um, they said, "We're, we're filming in Atlanta, Georgia, in America. And that, of course, was a bit... (laughs) That, that of course, was a bit disappointing because I don't like America. Mm. And um, I didn't want to be in Georgia for four months. So I just said, well, I I want a million pounds. And they said, well, you can have half a million. And I said, no, I don't want to do it. So I just stopped (laughs) it. I mean, really, it's a story about my own greed rather than anything else. <laughs> no, it's about you knowing your worth, which is great. Um, in the book, you mention a couple of well-known people that you're not the biggest fan of, one of them being Steve Martin, who you did Little Shop of Horrors with back in 1987. Why did you not enjoy that experience? Well, um, Steve was, um, a, um, was and is brilliant. I mean, I'm not, this is not about his talent, just about his... Uh, kindness at that time in his life. I mean, he was young. I don't know how long ago it was, a long time ago. But I was playing the dental receptionist in the scene which he plays the crazy dentist. And the film really was about, I can't remember, lots of things, but mainly in my scene, or I should say perhaps in his scene, um, I had to be knocked out several times. And I don't like that I didn't enjoy Mm. it and I had a splitting headache at the end of the day and he was incredibly unfriendly because he was a perfectionist he was an artist and all he was interested in was getting it right getting the comic moment right and he was he was correct to do that but he should have included me Mm. I would have included the person I was working with he he wasn't interested in that you know here was this fat girl who, who uh, his job was to connect with the fist the fist must knock her down not in time to the music and uh i just thought he was he was rather horrid and and um gifted when i saw it i saw the scene afterwards and i thought oh he's good yeah he really is good but he was a <laughs> that's all <laughs> i can tell you Uh, Another person who doesn't get the best rap in your book is Rolling Stones frontman Mick Jagger. Tell me about him. I don't know Mick Jagger, but I met him on an almost daily basis when he was the boyfriend of Sophie Dahl, who I was in a rather curious show um, called The Vagina Monologues. She was heaven, a young pretty interesting open brilliant girl really a nice woman and she was nuts about Mick Jagger who by then I suppose was in his 50s I I would imagine and I just thought what a what a miserable old git you know I just didn't like him he wasn't interested in Mm -hmm. anybody else 
you know, he didn't say good evening or how how's the show going. There was absolutely no. Con- he thought he was important, and he is important. But important people should never think that they're important, and mm. should never show it if they think it. So I just thought he was a tiresome old git, and he was very lucky to be having an affair with one of the most beautiful and charming women in in England. Uh, in this book, uh, you talk about how you do a lot of voiceover work now, and you actually started out kind of in voiceover work. You had a character called Sexy Sonia. Can you please tell everyone what Sexy Sonia was all about? Sexy Sonia, I think I did when I was probably 24 or 25, I can't remember. I heard that you could make some money doing porn tapes, not um, in, in vision, because I definitely wouldn't have done that. I really wouldn't. But, you know, a few simulated orgasms, which one does anyway in one's life, I thought, what, what's, what's the difference? So um, I auditioned in a CD sex shop warehouse in Tottenham Court Road. It was called Ann Summers, I think. And this fellow was in charge and he he handed me the script, which was all just about kind of bulging trousers. And um, I, it, it was just, you know, rather grubby. Um, and I, I did it. I got 300 quid. And again, I had a headache at the end of it. <laughs> so I don't look back on it with any joy. But the really embarrassing thing was, and I recount in, in my book, that when I went to see how it was selling, the man in the shop said, shh, because he didn't want people to know that I was sexy, Sonia. Because if they saw this kind of really not very pretty, rather heavy set woman come in and pretend to be a, a porn queen, it, it would have um, quelled their erections. And he, it's all about erections, isn't it, really? Can you remember the voice you put on for sexy, Sonia? I think it was very much my own voice. I, I probably it was it would have had an English accent. It would have been um I don't know. Hello. Do you want to undo your trousers? Do you want me to slip my hand in? I've done it before. Oh, what a big one. That's Ah, oh, you've still got it, Miriam. Uh, you speak about sex quite openly in the book, which is amazing. Uh, you mentioned that you're extremely grateful that complete strangers share their sex secrets with you. Was there a confession from a stranger once, without naming names, that blew your mind, that really took your breath away? I think one of the early ones, um, I used to go, I'm, I'm Jewish, but not a believer, and I used to belong to an organisation called Gay Yids. And I used to go around synagogues and try and get um, prejudiced Jews to see that gay people were just like anybody else, which I do passionately believe that we are. Mm. Anyway, we were talking about sex in in the synagogue <laughs> as opposed to the city. And um, this chap said um, that he could only have an orgasm if the girl was being sick. Wow. And I I've never forgotten that. And I thought what a what a awful situation to be in. Yeah. Both for him and for the girl. Yeah. That's just awful. So that was a rather troubling confession. I can't recall to mind huge other confessions. Mostly it's from women who discover that they are lesbian or have a a lesbian potential and they want to tell somebody because they're so embarrassed mm. and i think we just got to be all very relaxed about the whole thing yeah 100 well, percent. fun sex it is. is supposed to be for fun you mentioned in oh miriam that you're more famous now than you've ever been before which is you know Shocking because you've had a decades long career. Um, you start ha- you've started doing fan conventions every, every now and then, where you go and meet people who line up for hours to get their photo taken with you. Have you had any strange requests during those conventions? I don't think I have because I'm very matter of fact. 
when I meet fans, and I love meeting people generally because that's my joy, is to get to know people and understand them and work out how they and why they became as they are. And so when I when I meet fans, I don't want them to go gushy and silly. And sometimes they do. And, you know, they say, oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Uh, and I just want them to say, now, come on, you know, just let's have a chat. So, so no I'm, one's asking for foot pics. What are they? Oh, what I, is this that? is a thing that gets talked about in, uh, uh, in some TV shows about fan conventions where people who idolise celebrities ask for photos of their feet. Well, I'm very glad no one's done that. Because that, <laughs> that is not going to happen. <laughs> what nonsense. <laughs> really, people are... That's ridiculous. I'm sorry, I, I've got no time for that. This book is interesting. I absolutely bloody loved it. What do you hope is the main takeaway for people who read it? I hope they have a laugh mm. because I want to make people laugh. But I also want them to know who I am and know a bit more about me as a human being, because, you know, they have all kinds of ideas that I I read nothing but Harry Potter or that I'm sucking men off, you know, into my 90s. Not the case. Not the case. I just want to be known as a, as a human being. And I want politically to tell what I believe about the world. And at, at the moment, I feel very depressed about the world. And I think most people do. Everybody's worried. We've got climate change. We've had COVID. People don't have enough money to pay bills, to buy food. People are putting on weight. Um, I'm trying so hard not to um, because I've been fat all my life. So I think we're we're all anxious and worried and i think governments have got to step in and be human beings mm -hmm. instead of the corrupt bastards that a lot of them are mm -hmm. uh miriam this is such a good book thank you so much for writing it thank you so much for being who you are you are an absolute treasure and thank you for chatting to me once again well dear boy it was a great pleasure <laughs>